Section 12 of The Astral Plane, Its Inhabitants, Scenery, and Phenomena, by C. W. Ledbetter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Inhabitants, Artificial, Continued. 2. Elementals Formed Consciously. Since such results as have been described above have been achieved by the thought force of men who were entirely in the dark as to what they were doing, it will readily be imagined what a magician who understands the subject and can see exactly what effect he is producing may wield immense power along these lines. As a matter of fact, occultists of both the white and dark schools frequently use artificial elementals in their work and few tasks are beyond the powers of such creatures when scientifically prepared and directed with knowledge and skill for one who knows how to do so can maintain a connection with his elemental and guide it no matter at what distance it may be working so that it will practically act as though endowed with the full intelligence of its master very definite and very efficient guardian angels have sometimes been supplied in this way though it is probably very rarely that karma permits such a decided interference in a person's life as that would be in such a case however as that of a pupil of the adepts who might have in the course of his work for them to run the risk of attack from forces with which his unaided strength would be entirely insufficient to cope guardians of this description have been given and have fully proved their sleepless vigilance and their tremendous power by some of the more advanced processes of black magic also artificial elementals of great power may be called into existence and much evil has been worked in various ways by such entities but it is true of them as of the previous class that if they are aimed at a person whom by reason of his purity of character they are unable to influence they react with terrible force upon their creator so that the medieval story of the magician being torn to pieces by the fiends he himself has raised is no mere fable but may very well have an awful foundation in fact such creatures occasionally for various reasons escape from the control of those who are trying to make use of them and become wandering and aimless demons as do some of those mentioned under the previous heading under similar circumstances but those that we are considering having much more intelligence and power and a much longer existence are proportionately more dangerous they invariably seek for means of prolonging their life either by feeding like vampires upon the vitality of human beings or by influencing them to make offerings to them and among simple half-savage tribes they have frequently succeeded by judicious management in getting themselves recognized as village or family gods any deity which demands sacrifices involving the shedding of blood may always be set down as belonging to the lowest and most loathsome class of this order other less objectionable types are sometimes content with offerings of rice and cooked food of various kinds there are parts of india where both these varieties may be found flourishing even at the present day and in africa they are probably comparatively numerous by means of whatever nourishment they can obtain from the offerings and still more by the vitality they draw from their devotees they may continue to prolong their existence for many years or even centuries retaining sufficient strength to perform occasional phenomena of a mild type in order to stimulate the faith and zeal of their followers and invariably making themselves unpleasant in some way or other if the accustomed sacrifices are neglected for example it was asserted recently that in one indian village the inhabitants had found that whenever for any reason the local deity did not get his or her regular meals spontaneous fires began to break out with alarming frequency among the cottages sometimes three or four simultaneously in cases where they declared it was impossible to suspect human agency and other stories of a more or less similar nature will no doubt recur to the memory of any reader who knows something of the out-of-the-way corners 
of that most wonderful of all countries. The art of manufacturing, artificial elementals of extreme virulence and power, seems to have been one of the specialties of the magicians of Atlantis, the lords of the dark face. One example of their capabilities in this line is given in The Secret Doctrine, Volume 2, page 427, where we read of the wonderful speaking animals, who had to be quieted by an offering of blood, lest they should awaken their masters and warn them of the impending destruction. But apart from these strange beasts, they created other artificial entities of power and energy so tremendous that it is darkly hinted that some of them have kept themselves in existence even to this day, though it is more than eleven thousand years since the cataclysm which overwhelmed their original masters. The terrible Indian goddess, whose devotees were impelled to commit in her name the awful crimes of the Thuggi, the ghastly Kali, worshipped even to this day with rites too abominable to be described, might well be a relic of a system which had to be swept away, even at the cost of the submergence of a continent and the loss of sixty-five million human lives. 3. Human Artificials We have now to consider a class of entities which, though it contains but very few individuals, has acquired from its intimate connection with one of the great movements of modern times an importance entirely out of proportion to its numbers. It seems doubtful whether it should appear under the first or third of our main divisions, but, though certainly human, it is so far removed from the course of ordinary evolution, so entirely the product of a will outside of its own, that it perhaps falls most naturally into place among the artificial beings. The easiest way of describing it will be to commence with its history, and to do that we must once more look back to the great Atlantean race. In thinking of the adepts and schools of occultism of that remarkable people, our minds instinctively revert to the evil practices of which we hear so much in connection with their latter days. But we must not forget that before the age of selfishness and degradation, the mighty civilization of Atlantis had brought forth much that was noble and worthy of admiration, and that among its leaders were some who now stand upon the loftiest pinnacles as yet attained by man. Among the lodges for occult study preliminary to initiation, formed by the adepts of the good law, was one in a certain part of America which was then tributary to one of the great Atlantean monarchs, the divine rulers of the Golden Gate. And, though it has passed through many and strange vicissitudes, though it has had to move its headquarters from country to country, as each in turn was invaded by the jarring elements of a later civilization, that lodge still exists even at the present day, observing still the same old-world ritual, even teaching as a sacred and hidden language the same Atlantean tongue which was used at its foundation so many thousands of years ago. It still remains what it was from the first, a lodge of occultists of pure and philanthropic aims, which can lead those students whom it finds worthy no inconsiderable distance on the road to knowledge, and confers such psychic powers are in its gift only after the most searching tests as to the fitness of the candidate. Its teachers do not stand upon the adept level, yet hundreds have learned through it how to set their feet upon the path which has led them to adept ship in later lives, and, though it is not in direct communication with the Brotherhood of the Himalayas, there are some among the latter who have themselves been connected with it in former incarnations, and therefore retain a more than ordinarily friendly interest in its proceedings. The chiefs of this lodge, though they have always kept themselves and their society strictly in the background, have, nevertheless, done what they could from time to time to assist the progress of truth in the world and some half-century ago in despair at the rampant materialism which seemed to be stifling all spirituality in europe and america they determined to make an attempt to combat it by somewhat novel methods in point of fact to offer opportunities 
by which any reasonable man could acquire absolute proof of that life apart from the physical body which it was the tendency of science to deny the phenomena exhibited were not in themselves absolutely new since in some form or other we may hear of them all through history but their definite organization their production as it were to order these were features distinctly new to the modern world the movement they thus set on foot gradually grew into the vast fabric of modern spiritualism and though it would perhaps be unfair to hold the originators of the scheme directly responsible for the many results which have followed we must admit that they have achieved their purpose to the extent of converting vast numbers of people from a belief in nothing in particular to a firm faith in at any rate some kind of future life this is undoubtedly a magnificent result though in the opinion of many of those whose power and knowledge enable them to take a wider view of such matters than we can it has been attained at too great a cost since it seems to them that on the whole the harm done outweighs the good the method adopted was to take some ordinary person after death arouse him thoroughly upon the astral plane instruct him to a certain extent in the powers and possibilities belonging to it and then put him in charge of a spiritualistic circle he in his turn developed other departed personalities along the same line they all acted upon those who sat at their seances and developed them as mediums and so spiritualism grew and flourished no doubt living members of the original lodge occasionally manifested themselves in astral form at some of the circles perhaps they may do so even now but in most cases they simply gave such direction and guidance as they considered necessary to the persons they had put in charge there is little doubt that the movement increased so much more rapidly than they expected that it soon got quite beyond their control so that as has been said for many of the later developments they can only be held indirectly responsible of course the intensification of the astral plane life of those persons who were thus put in charge of circles distinctly delayed their natural progress and though the idea had been that anything lost in this way would be fully atoned for by the good karma attained by helping to lead others to the truth it was soon found that it was impossible to make use of a spirit guide for any length of time without doing him serious and permanent injury in some cases such guides were therefore withdrawn and others substituted for them in others it was considered for various reasons undesirable to make such a change and then a very remarkable expedient was adopted which gave rise to the curious class of creatures we have called human artificials the higher principles of the original guide were allowed to pass on their long delayed evolution into the devachonic condition but the shade he left behind him was taken possession of sustained and operated upon so that it might appear to its admiring circle practically just as before this seems at first to have been done by members of the lodge themselves but apparently that arrangement was found irksome or unsuitable or perhaps it was considered a waste of force and the same objection applied to the use for this purpose of an artificial elemental so that it was eventually decided that the departed person who would have been appointed to succeed the late spirit guide should still do so but should take possession of the latter's shade or shell and in fact simply wear his appearance it is said that some members of the lodge objected to this on the ground that though the purpose might be entirely good a certain amount of deception was involved but the general opinion seems to have been that as the shade really was the same and contained something at any rate of the original lower manas there was nothing that could be called deception in the matter this then was the genesis of the human artificial entity and it is understood that in some cases 
more than one such change has been made without arousing suspicion though on the other hand some investigators of spiritualism have remarked on the fact that after a considerable lapse of time certain differences suddenly become observable in the manner and disposition of a spirit it is needless to say that none of the adept brotherhood has ever approved of the formation of an artificial entity of this sort though they could not interfere with any one who thought it right to take such a course a weak point in the arrangement is that many others besides the original lodge may adopt this plan and there is nothing whatever to prevent black magicians from supplying communicating spirits as indeed they have been known to do with this class we conclude our survey of the inhabitants of the astral plane with the reservations specially made some few pages back the catalogue may be taken as a fairly complete one but it must once more be emphasized that this treatise claims only to sketch the merest outline of a very vast subject the detailed elaboration of which would need a lifetime of study and hard work End of section twelve.